everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It might not be a term you're familiar with, but in fact, it is a situation that may affect as many as 25% of American adults, and it may be lethal. It is a very common disease that goes hand in hand with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Our guest today has written a very compelling book called Skinny Liver, and uh, her name is Kristen Kirkpatrick. She is a, the manager of the Wellness Nutrition Services at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, where she oversees the nutrition-related services for the Center for Lifestyle Medicine. She is an award-winning dietitian, having won the 2012 uh, Dietetic Educator of the Year Award in Ohio. Uh, she is a regular guest on uh, both uh, local as well as national television a program she's been on the Dr. Oz Show, the NBC Nightly News, the Today Show, as well as uh, National Public Radio. Uh, she received her BA degree from George Washington University and a master's in health promotion from American University, and her dietetics training took place at the University of Akron. Uh, the book is written along with Dr. Ibrahim Hanune, who is a gastroenterologist. In fact, he's assistant professor of gastroenterology at Case Western uh, Reserve University. So. We're about to learn some very interesting uh, information uh, related to the liver and how to protect it. Hi, Kristen. It's really great to talk to you today. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show. I think this is a terrific book. And for Thank all you. of our viewers, I get the advanced reading copy, which was not for sale. But just all so right. everybody knows, you can go to Amazon and they can buy the book right now. So. Let's just jump in. Um, I think that people don't really think much about liver disease, and in this case, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, but it's a big problem, isn't it? It's a big problem, and it impacts, um, obviously it impacts obese people. Uh, we have a very huge percentage of Americans that are walking around with it and don't even know that they have it. Uh, but obesity is not just the only story, though. They, it can occur in people that are a little bit overweight, and of course, we have seen cases and studies where people can develop it uh, and they're not even overweight. So I, I think it's a huge problem. It's, it's relatively asymptomatic in the early stages and many people are not aware that it's even inflicting them. So uh, how big of a deal is it? I mean, I've heard statistics saying as much as, as many as 25% of adult Americans may be involved with this. Yeah, about 25%. That's ac actually a pretty accurate estimate based on some of the recent uh, meetings with the American Liver Foundation. Uh, and, and also looking at the huge percentages of obese people that have it. Some of the predictions are anywhere from 60 to 80% of obese people do have it. So uh, again, if, if you happen to be obese, morbidly obese for sure, uh, the chances of you having it are, are very high. All right. Now, uh, you know, people who read the book, and I, I'm really excited to see that it's already a uh, bestseller in, in Amazon and Health, which is great. Thank you. Um, people are thinking, well, um, yet another thing to worry about. You know, I've heard of Alzheimer's and diabetes and cancer, and now there's this new thing, but it's really not a new thing, and it's extremely pervasive. So why has it not really, you know, been in the forefront if it's such a big deal? Well, I think that the numbers, uh, Dr. Perlmutter, definitely have been rising over the past few decades, but it's getting a lot more attention now because now we see it as the fourth leading cause of liver transplantation. We're seeing it in the pediatric population. So it's starting to get the attention because people are actually um, going to those more advanced stages of it. And as people go to those advanced stages, we hear more about it because it becomes more scary. All right. So we're talking about something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is a problem with the liver that is not necessarily induced by alcohol, but what's causing it? So uh, the, the main primary cause of it, and, and, and of course if you look at the studies, uh, some researchers will say we're not 100% sure what the mechanism is, but um, it's a pretty firm belief that uh, lifestyle choices are definitely the cause of it. So a poor diet, inactivity, uh, stress levels, and, and then even just looking at um, toxins. I mean, the liver is the main organ that actually detoxifies things in the body. So looking at some of these toxins and how they then interact. And then, of course, uh, looking at kind of the piggyback condition. So if you have insulin resistance or even if you have heart disease, things of that nature, um, your prevalence for this goes up. So I would say if your diet is something you have not cared about, 
whether you are a normal weight or even slightly overweight, if you're not active, uh, that's going to be a huge risk factor. Now, um, you know, the, the increased uh, prevalence has kind of very much paralleled the increased prevalence of uh, overweight and obesity. And that said, one would then assume that uh, some of the lifestyle choices that, that we're making as a population may relate to both of these events. And I think that's clearly what the science is telling us. But in the case of uh, the sugar fructose, it looks as if that uniquely may be uh, playing a, at least an assistive, if not a causative role in causing this situation. How does that work? So the reason that fructose is such a big player in this is that um, fructose can only be metabolized by the liver. So obviously the, the liver metabolizes um, all of our macronutrients in some way, but with fructose, in the case of fructose, it metabolizes it's pretty much 100%. And so when the liver gets overwhelmed with um, having too much fructose in the diet, a lot of people blame soda for, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it then develops these fat deposits in the hepatic cells. And so I think because fructose is primarily, primarily the driver that needs to be metabolized by this organ, as opposed to other forms of sugar that are being metabolized by other organs, and then and have some metabolism from the liver, um, it's a huge thing. And of course, coinciding with the huge amount of fructose in the American diet, um, sometimes hidden and sometimes right out there in plain view. So our cells can use glucose as an energy source and um, do so very fairly handily. Uh, glucose is driven into the cell for its metabolism by the hormone insulin. But when we consume fructose, like in the form uh, that's in high fructose corn syrup, which does contain glucose as well, but when we get extra fructose, fruit sugar in that form, then it's not something that our cells use for energy, and it ends up store, basically storing itself in the liver for, for the future. And, and the liver then is, is filled with the end products here, mostly triglycerides, and it becomes fatty and enlarged. Yes. Uh, now, yeah, absolutely. The, the liver then is not able to work as well in terms of detoxification. Yes, that's right. So when you, again, look at some of these studies, especially when we start advancing to some of these you know, very advanced stages of the disease, um, the liver is simply, it, it, it can't get things out, right? I mean, that's the whole filter process of it, blood flowing through it, filtering things. I mean, that's what the liver has to do. So when it is overwhelmed by fats, um, you know, the liver, of course, has a normal amount of fat, and we, we do see that 5 to 10%, but once we get into those huge amounts of fat really taking over, it, it simply can't do its job. Very similar to looking at um, heart disease or things like that, where we have fat accumulation, you know, an artery or something like that, and, and the organ can no longer function the way it is meant to. You mentioned in your book uh, how then toxins uh, that we are all exposed to can be uh, more detrimental to us. And uh, first, let's talk about what those toxins may be. Yeah, so um, some of the main toxins that I looked at are, number one, coming from our food. Uh, because I'm a dietitian, that was the, the first place where I thought, okay, this is the most interesting and the thing I see most of the days with my patients at Cleveland Clinic. So looking at some of the farmed uh, fishes that we have, the toxins coming in there, looking at non-organic vegetables, especially those that are the dirty dozen, uh, and just kind of really breaking down what are those pesticides, herbicides, what are those things doing when they get into our body, especially if our liver is not at tip-top form and can't really metabolize them and get them out. So that was the first one I looked at. So, um, you know, others may, may not really be thinking when we talk about toxins uh, about uh, for example, taking Tylenol, acetaminophen, which is right. in so many medications and is highly dependent upon liver function uh, to be yes. processed. So, you know, in a case like this, we start to develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Even taking uh, a Tylenol could be a significant uh, trauma to us. Yes, absolutely. And um, with the book, the, the contributing author that I worked with is a hepatologist. And so we really did have a lot of discussions about some of the pharmacological toxins that we are, are putting in our body on a regular basis that we don't need a prescription for, Tylenol being one of them. Um, it's been pretty well known, at least for my patients, that Tylenol is not great for the liver, but it again becomes especially worse when the liver is not functioning normally or we're taking um, very large amounts or we're taking it very frequently and we're just not giving the liver a break. 
And, you know, generally, these folks who are at risk for NAFDL uh, are the ones who are probably taking diabetic medications, pain medications, and who knows what else. They're the, the more likely medicated group who can uh, ill afford to, to challenge their detox pathways. Right. I agree. I, I mean, I, I really think that uh, when you look at the numbers here, typically someone will have NAFLD and they will have something else associated with it. Um, most likely diabetes could be coronary heart disease uh, and any number of conditions. And so I, I think that because we are looking at that population, for the most part, the majority of the diagnosed cases uh, yes, I agree that we, we have things like that, the toxins that are in the medicines, even things like cleaning products. Uh, that was another big thing for me because you might not even think about it. You might not think about what you're using to spray in your kitchen. Um, where does the, 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 the after effect of that go and how are we absorbing it through our skin and then how does it get out of our body? We, we tend not to think of those things. I, I, you know, I really think you bring up a terrific point that we are so challenged in our modern world with toxins uh, around every corner that we, you know, really, really depend on functionality of our liver. And now uh, a lot of people are compromising that and they're inducing it based upon their dietary choices. So, um, you know, it, it, it becomes a, a vicious circle. You also uh, talk about um, non-alcoholic um, steatohepatitis. Uh, tell us about yeah. that. So that is when we start to get into more of the advanced stages. So once we have that fat accumulation, that's what we would call kind of the first hit. Um, now, NAFLD is often referred to as a multi-hit condition. And so the first hit is that fat accumulation. Once we now get into some fibrosis, increased inflammation, um, that then can lead to cirrhosis. Now you're in that um, NASH stage. And once you get into those areas, you're really in a place where it's much more hard to reverse it. So even at the beginning of our conversation, Dr. Perlmutter talking about how people don't think about it the way they think about heart disease or diabetes, things of that nature, um, you know, it's so reversible, whereas a lot of those other conditions are not always as easily reversible. They, they can be as well, but um, this is so reversible in the early stages, but we don't have the symptoms that some of those other conditions provide to us as that warning, that red light to tell us, stop now, let's try and reverse this. I, and I want to stop you right there because that's a real uh, empowering uh, point that early on when this is beginning to happen, and, and you know, for most people, it's a silent issue. They don't know yeah. this is happening, but you can be sure if, if you're type 2 diabetic or significantly overweight, you're really more than likely to have at least early stages, if not moderate stages of the situation. Yeah. But again, this is what I want to call attention to for our viewers is that what you're saying and what the science clearly indicates is that there is profound reversibility uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the time to fix a roof is when the sun is shining. So, so that said, um, I think those of you who are, you know, significantly overweight uh, in our audience who or, or and or type 2 diabetic, uh, time to get this book and, and start the program right away. And, uh, you know, in, in reading through, uh, Kristen, your recommendations, you know, so beautifully fall in line with what many of the people I interview are talking about. I did do an interview recently with, uh, it's kind of off topic, but just to be, you know, to be fair and have a civil conversation about, you know, uh, other ideas about gluten and wheat. But that said, uh, you know, I think that you call attention to the incredible amount of sugar and specifically fructose that we just talked about in the American diet. So, you know, I know that you're working there at the Cleveland Clinic. That's pretty much where people are going, isn't it? It's really rejecting the notion of sugar and even uh, it's, you know, even complex carbohydrates as being necessarily good foods for us. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we do see that a lot with our patients, uh, even with some of our patients that have been really struggling to try and lose weight. They are eating healthy foods, healthy, um, healthy matters of pattern with their food. And um, sometimes if we try and take them off of grains for just a little bit, they're able to jumpstart that. They're able to really help to improve their weight loss. Um, we've done that with many of our patients. And obviously um, at the Wellness Institute where I am, we do test pretty regularly for gluten sensitivities, casein sensitivities, um, things like that, again, that may not bring up the most obvious symptoms early on. 
whether there's a direct relationship between these sensitivities and the production of, of NAFDL, nonetheless, you know, the downstream, no pun, well, pun very much intended, effect uh, of this liver issue is increase in inflammation. And, yes. and that said, these uh, food sensitivities that you mentioned can contribute yet to more uh, level, higher levels of inflammation and therefore, you know, certainly add fuel to the fire. You mentioned, you know, we've been talking about the importance of lifestyle factors and choices as it relates to this disease. Uh, there are some genetic issues as well. And can you tell us about that? Um, yeah. So when we looked at some of the numbers, there were a uh, higher prevalence in certain genetic populations. So we saw a Native American and Hispanic population, um, definitely in the Asian population. There were certain populations where if all things were equal and someone from that genetic background was overweight or obese, they were much more likely to develop the condition. Um, again, some of that is unexplained, but we definitely did see some correlations with certain populations and just having a much higher prevalence regardless of lifestyle factors. The other uh, points about your book, and just to read the subtitle, it says, uh, eliminate everyday toxins, who wouldn't want to do that? Avoid diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Avoid diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. It's a liver book. Why do you make liver that book. claim? I mean, I know why you make the claim, but I want you to tell yeah. our audience. So the reason I did is because really the, the suggestions that I made in the book in terms of turning your life around, getting the toxins out, being able to lose weight, getting the right diet, um, are really things that also work in the prevention of both diabetes and heart disease, um, and even improving brain health, and, and the list go on and on and on, and cancer and things like that. Uh, we didn't have enough room on the cover for me to put that. Um, but those are the big ones, and those are probably the majority of the patients that I see are either going to have heart disease, diabetes, or they'll have both. Um, so it was really important for me to look at this diet and in a way that, okay, if we're looking at how we metabolize these nutrients, the role that the liver takes in the metabolism part, and then how that then impacts other diseases, this can also prevent some of those other things and pr quite frankly can even help to reverse some of those other conditions as well. So, you know, again, you said you didn't have enough room on the cover and I like that explanation because... Uh, you know, I want to just make it so clear that when, when we see uh, lifestyle choices that open the door for type 2 diabetes and obesity, uh, that's kind of just the gatekeeper for all of our chronic degenerative conditions, including things like Alzheimer's and, and uh, even cancer for that matter. And I think, you know, in this age of personalized medicine where people want to have a specific recommendation for themselves, nonetheless, uh, we know the broad strokes. And the broad strokes are diets, for example, that are reduced in sugar and simple carbohydrates and have more fiber in them and higher levels of good fat. These are the broad strokes. Now, you know, to be specific about an individual's need based upon his or her genetic predisposition, that's wonderful and exciting. But, you know, I think, you know, a book like yours makes broad stroke recommendations that are very, very valuable. And, and I really commend you for it. Um, I think this is terrific. And I think that you're going to go a long way uh, now that the book is available to really raising awareness to a very pervasive problem that for whatever reason has slipped in under the radar, but uh, not anymore. I mean, not, 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 now that we have your book, it's really right. very, very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, we'll talk soon. And I sure appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. It's been a privilege, Dr. Okay. Perlmutter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been a very enlightening interview. Again, the book is called Skinny Liver, now available on Amazon, a bestseller. And Skinny Liver is uh, really an eye-opening um, experience to read that book, uh, really calling our attention to a very pervasive problem, this uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease that is by and large uh, brought on by lifestyle choices. And what is so compelling about uh, the book is that it really gives us a blueprint in terms of doing our best to avoid the situation. So it's a really good read. I recommend you pick it up. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter.